and welcome everyone to the Trans Accessible Libraries Initiative webinar. This webinar is being live captioned and a web link is in the chat box, which I'm putting in now. And you may prefer to use the multimedia viewer to view the captions in your WebEx screen. And to do that, go to the lower right hand corner of your WebEx screen and you'll see um, three little dots towards the bottom. Hover over that and then select the multimedia viewer if it's not appearing on your WebEx screen. Once you select the multimedia viewer, it's going to appear on the right side of your chat, and you can also pop that out um, by clicking on that little box in the top. All attendees were muted as you entered the room, and you don't have the ability to unmute yourself. Please put your questions and your comments in the chat box using that little speech bubble at the bottom of your screen throughout this session and make sure that your chat comments are going to everyone so that we can all see your comments and questions. For attending today's session, you will get a Medical Library, Educa Medical Library Association CE credit, and I'm going to provide more information about that at the end of the webinar, along with an evaluation for this session. This webinar, like all NNLM hosted webinars, follows a code of conduct, and I'm going to put that in the chat now. So thank you for following our code of conduct throughout this session. And now I'd like to turn things over to Marianne Hansen to introduce our guest speakers in this webinar. Hello, everybody. I'm Marianne Hansen, Research Services Librarian at Montana State University in Bozeman, Montana, and I'm also the current chair of the Pacific Northwest Chapter of the Medical Library Association Diversity Committee. Uh, thank you all for joining us for this next presentation of the PNC MLA Diversity Committee Speaker Series, the Trans Accessible Library Initiative. I am delighted to introduce Julie Lusinger, who's uh, women's and Gender Study and LGBTQ Studies Subject Librarian at the University of North Texas Libraries, and Kobe Condry, Research Support Services Librarian at the University of North Texas Libraries, former Collection Development Librarian or Liaison Librarian. And I'm putting the speaker series link in the chat for everyone. So thank you all so much for being here. And watch for probably another speaker series presentation in maybe February. I guess that's us. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you for um, the opportunity to participate in the speaker series and to give us the chance to tell you about an initiative targeted to the transgender community at the University of North Texas. UNT is a research university with an enrollment of over 42,000 students, served by about 3,100 faculty, 2,500 staff. Um, UNT is the fifth largest university in Texas among the 40 largest in the United States, and our library was just recently awarded ARL status just to give you kind of a picture of um, where Kobe and I are. Um, and you all already introduced us, but I'm Julie. This is my partner in crime here, Kobe. Um, and I think I'm ready for slide. All right, so in this presentation, Julie and I will just describe why we wanted to do a project related to resources for transgender people, how we determined what might be useful, how we went about picking materials, how we spread the word about the project, and where we hope to take the project in the future. Uh, at the end, we'll be good academics and provide citations for our background work, and then we'll welcome your questions or comments. 
Julie will start with an introduction to our project named the Trans Accessible Libraries Initiative. But first, let's do a quick poll. Uh, we are interested to know whether your library is pursuing any diversity, equity, inclusion, or accessibility efforts. Um, would you respond to our question, which is, does your library have any of these initiatives? We'll give you a few minutes to, res a few seconds to respond. And that's probably long enough. Let's get some preliminary results. Emily, can you put the results up? User error on my part. I'm not sure why they're uh, <laughs> not showing on your screen, so I'm going to report them to you. Um, okay. So we have 61% of attendees said yes, 4% okay. of attendees said no, and 18% of attendees reported that they don't know. Okay, so the majority um, are doing something related to DEI, and we hope that this presentation will expand the scope of those efforts, or if you're not doing anything yet, maybe it'll inspire you to add the transgender audience to your considerations for services and collections. So now I'll turn it back over to Julie to tell us about how the project started. Oh, I see the results now. Um, thank you all for participating in that. That will kind of help me tweak the uh, reporting out the best practices part um, at the end. Um, so to get started in 2020, Kobe and I applied for some intramural funding to start the Trans Accessible Libraries Initiative to investigate how we could make our library services and collections more accessible to our trans students. Most of the funding we requested was targeted to be a collection enhancement with a small portion for promotion and travel. So to dive in, current research highlights some of the barriers to information that transgender individuals face. While they're frequently just lumped in with the rest of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and queer community, their needs are significantly different and I think the acronym LGBTQ plus perpetuates some of the confusion around gender versus sexuality in a primarily cis hetero world. Since the UNT Libraries has become a known repository for LGBTQ plus studies through our collections and trained personnel, we believe the libraries are well positioned to provide effective informational resources trans people seek. As such, our research question addresses how the library can create a best practices model that responds to trans and gender non-binary people's information seeking behaviors to make the libraries a safe, accessible quality source for trans information needs. Our hope is by sharing out what we did, how we did it, and what we learned here and in other platforms, others can either replicate the project for other historically marginalized populations, or at least take the parts of this initiative that work best for them. Um, we started out with an environmental survey and a needs assessment, which I'll cover on the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, recent national surveys indicate that trans people do not typically turn to libraries for their information. According to the 2015 U.S. Transgender Survey, nearly one quarter of people who are out or perceived to be transgender in college or vocational school were verbally, physically, or sexually harassed. Additionally, one in five did not use at least one type of public accommodation in the last year because they feared they would be mistreated as a transgender person and libraries would be included here as a public accommodation. In 2016, I worked with some colleagues on the Texas Gender Project, which was funded by another Dean's Innovation Grant. We asked transgender Texans about their impressions of library services, then asked Texas librarians about their knowledge of transgender issues. 
We shared our recommendations based on our findings, which mirrored those of the 2015 U.S. Transgender Survey with the Texas Library Journal in the 2017 article, Providing Inclusive Services to Transgender Customers. In 2017, a research survey by Drake entitled Equitable Access, Information Seeking Behavior, Information Needs, and Necessary Library Accommodations for Transgender Patrons addressed accommodations libraries needed to make for transgender individuals to feel safe, what areas had the greatest unmet information needs, and why trans people did not use libraries as an information resource at all. Some of the accommodations the author mentions included current transgender literature, gender identity and expression as part of their institution's non-discrimination policy, and gender-neutral restrooms. Unmet information needs included transgender health, legal, and political advocacy information. Some reasons for overall low library satisfaction were either not enough applicable resources and a discomfort at interacting with library staff. Finally, in 2019, I read Stephen Kruger's book, Supporting Trans People in Libraries, which is really what sparked my interest in the topic of our research question that I shared earlier. If you don't have this book in your library, I highly encourage you to get a copy. It addresses aspects of both public and technical services in helping libraries to become more affirming places. We do have some additional resources we consulted and we included them at the end of the presentation, but these were particularly helpful. Slide. The sort of tipping point, if you will, was chatting with Kobe about some of these studies. I mentioned that I'd noticed a trend of trans folks, particularly in online forums, asking each other for information based on their lived experiences. That in and of itself is fine. For example, where can I go that's trans friendly to get a haircut? Or how do I tell my family I'm transitioning? Other things I noticed being asked were far more appropriate to ask a doctor or therapist because some of the information they received was actually very harmful, such as how do I get hormones without a doctor? There's nothing wrong with asking your peers, but I was concerned they weren't fact checking the information. So typically I'd stay in my lane on these forums because I'm not trans, but I am on one that is open for six cis folks called um, Ask a Transgender Person, so that's what I did. Hey, just out of curiosity, do you ever go to the library for trans-related information? Why or why not? Um, I expected to hear that they had bad experiences at a library or didn't want to out themselves to get information similar to the surveys I mentioned, but what I learned from the millennials and Gen Z was they did not see us relevant in this area that we wouldn't have the appropriate resources or our resources would be so out of date, it would be pointless to go to the library. It's just easier to Google or ask on a forum. After further research, the literature backed this up. They do not consider libraries a reliable source of information, at least not in this area. Needless to say, Kobe was just as surprised as I was to learn about it and said, we have to do something about this we can do something about this at UNT, so we did. We wanted to make sure our collections were up to date and meeting students' needs. In addition to that, we wanted to package it in such a way that we weren't telling them not to ask their peers, but instead acknowledging that their community is a great place to start their research, but to also include information they can find in the library from health practitioners effectively encouraging them to use their information literacy skills to determine what is right for their situation. It was also very important to us not to make students have to out themselves to provide feedback since this population is hidden and less self-identified and we wanted to respect their privacy. We determined that, that there was enough existing research that consulted actual transgender individuals that addressed information seeking behaviors of transgender persons and their perceptions of the library. That coupled with an excellent relationship with the Pride Alliance, which is our campus gender and sexuality resource office, provided a foundation for learning the needs of our local community to make our collection services and resources more accessible, useful, and visible to our transgender students. 
most of the funding we asked for went to collection enhancement um, and part of the needs assessment for this initiative included an assessment of the collection but I think what Kobe along with our collection assessment unit did was so unique and interesting that it deserves its own section of the presentation so I'm turning it over to Kobe for the next slide. All right, thank you, Julie. Um, to figure out what UNT's collection needed on transgender related issues, I first had to acknowledge that the way library collections include transgenderism and transgender awareness is developing. Books on these topics could appear in parts of the classification system that varied widely, sometimes in areas that were somewhat related but nuanced in their differences, and at other times in areas that don't spring to mind naturally. For example, some books could be classed in the ranges for homosexuality or for transvestism, or could appear in very different areas of the collection like medicine, public health, literature, criminal justice, politics, and public administration, uh, depending upon how the works treated or focused on the issues. So I did about 10 searches in the library's book identif identification tool, Gobi, um, using natural language terms for keywords that could appear anywhere in the book's record. Uh, the four phrases or books that were most useful for this scoping exercise were sex change, gender affirmation, gender reassignment, and transsexual. After compiling a list of titles matching these terms, I extracted the classification numbers and the subject headings. I next checked the subject headings in the Library of Congress subject headings online database, mainly to confirm that I had tracked the most important ones and had not overlooked any headings that I could have missed in the Gobi searches. Then I went to the Library of Congress classification schedules online, and there I went through each letter and searched for subject terms in parts of the schedules that were not immediately associated with transgender topics. I did this again to be sure that I didn't overlook something important like a call number range or a subject heading that fell outside of the HQ range where most transgender works appear. After this research, I was able to compile a list of classification numbers and subject headings that I hoped would cover almost every imaginable book on transgender related issues. As expected, HQ 77 figured prominently in the range that covers transvestism, transsexualism, and transgenderism. However, I was able to add classification ranges in the Bs for psychological aspects of gender identity and sex roles, in the GV range covering leisure activities, in the Ks for minority rights and discrimination issues, in the P section for sex differences in linguistics, in the Rs for a variety of topics like the neuroscience of sex differences and gender roles, sex change and voice register, and finally a small segment in the TR range for applied photography of transgender people and sexual minorities. I shared this information with Julie so she could get a glimpse of how collection development makes the sausage, and I think she was suitably astounded. She was really fascinated by the LC schedules. Next slide, please. So Julie and I then turn to our colleague here at UNT, the collection assessment librarian, Karen Harker, so that Karen could give us an expert overview of the existing collection and an analysis of potential needs. Karen's department put together a collection evaluation report using circulation, interlibrary loan, usage data, as well to make collection enhancement recommendations based on the call number ranges that we suggested, as well as the other ranges that cross matched with the appropriate subject headings. Karen has an amazing ability to tease out this kind of um, interrelational information in a much more rational way than my touchy feely best guess system. Um, the collection evaluation confirmed our impression that the existing collection was relatively small, growing old, and offered mainly in print. Only 25% of the monographs were in ebook format. Uh, the results indicated a decline in usage of the holdings, 
as many academic libraries like UNT's have an increasing demand from its patrons for electronic resources rather than print. Overall, the report notes that sociology uh, was the strongest of the subject categories in terms of holdings, usage, interest, and need, although this group was very weak regarding ebook holdings. Next slide, please. Uh, one very useful feature that the collection assessment provided was this qualitative matrix of subjects where Karen displayed the call number ranges in a way that would provide guidance for developing the collection. For example, the dark green quadrant where usage is high and interlibrary loan requests are low should receive less enhancement than the red quadrant where there is low usage of the collection and high interlibrary loan rates. So at this point, we now had the evidence that our collection on transgender topics could use some better resources. And we also knew the classification ranges that had the highest potential to meet patron needs. Next slide, please. Uh, once I had the collection assessment, I revisited Gobi and ran searches using keywords drawn from my list and applying the parameters that Julie and I had derived from our understanding of the literature uh, regarding user behavior in our needs assessment. We wanted ebooks so that students did not have to come to the library physically if they were not comfortable and they wanted to maintain privacy. Uh, we wanted books published within the last 10 years so the collection would be up to date. Uh, mostly books published in the US, uh, if they were how to, especially, for example, how to navigate the health insurance system. English language because that's the primary language on our campus and books for an adult audience. We excluded books that were on teens, children, and the elderly since our users are young adults mainly. Um, however, if you are in a public library, you should consider including those demographics. Uh, we also excluded LGBTQ plus books that were too broadly focused. Um, instead of focusing on transgender or gender, ident gender identity specific issues, uh, a lot of LGBTQ plus publications focus very little on the T part of it. So after applying all these filters, I compiled a list of 118 eBooks that met our goals. The total cost for these titles exceeded our budget by about double our grant allocation. Uh, so the next step uh, was to winnow the selections, and we did so by consulting our potential users about their interests. Next slide, please. That's it. Um, so we deemed it critical to get input from the population that this in initiative was to serve. So we partnered with the UNT Pride Alliance, as well as select faculty, to get the survey links out to the right students. We did not want students to have to out themselves just to participate which is why the survey being anonymous was so important. Julie established categories of books by general content type. These categories were like medical books, humanities books, social sciences. Um, and we put, she put the titles from our Gobi potential selections into the categories and then created Qualtrics surveys to gauge the interest in the titles of the respondents. The options were very simple. Yes, I'm interested. No, I'm not. And then an optional feedback text box. After gathering the results, we applied the user preferences to make our final selections. The preferences that we found most noteworthy were that overall the respondents expressed no desire for reading memoirs, but they were highly interested in books that address the medical aspects of transitioning to a different gender. Next slide, please. So this slide shows a portion of the worksheet that I created to track a variety of characteristics about the books on our list of potential selections. Um, I wanted to know things like, does UNT have it already? Um, whether it was a candidate for our demand-driven acquisitions program, uh, if it was in a priority call number range, what was the best price, what was its survey category, and how did it rate among the users who, who responded about it? Um, of course, there's more data 
things like publication date, author names, ISBNs, but I wanted to kind of show uh, you some of the titles and the elements that really drove our decision making. I looked at a number of ways to get the most content to the users, and after consulting with Julie, I, uh, eventually we settled on 39 titles that would be purchased outright for almost the exact budget of $3,000. These were designated as buy or maybe on the worksheet, and they were generally rated the highest amongst the users. We also decided to include 71 titles by adding them to our DDA pool as making them available this way would have no immediate cost, but had the potential for permanent addition to the collection if usage triggered them at some point in the future. UNT already owned a couple of the titles uh, in the potential selections list. So of the 118 potential titles, patrons would actually have access to 112 of them. The small image offset at the bottom shows the six titles that were excluded. They are mostly memoirs or titles that got very low interest from our survey respondents. So moving to the next slide, I'll turn it over to Julie for the next steps in our initiative. Okay, thank you, Kobe. So while he worked on the collection side of things, I worked on putting together a LibGuide as a primary means of promotion and outreach to make what we were offering more visible and accessible. The home page of the guide provides a basic overview of the purpose of the guide itself and the Trans Accessible Libraries Initiative in general. I used the research from the needs assessment to determine exactly what to highlight in the guide. For example, the library services page highlights services and facilities that might concern a transgender individual. It focuses on maintaining patron privacy from how to ensure we're using their chosen name to using the self-checkout machine. It also covers restrooms and getting research help online. As I mentioned earlier, part of the initiative was to encourage a broader range of information-seeking behavior that would extend through and beyond the library. So there's an information literacy guide on how to find reliable information. However, the entire guide really encourages this. I decided to break down the guide by topic because I think I was determined to prove that the library has a little bit of everything um, that was published currently. So I included everything Kobe purchased in mental health, religion, employment, criminal justice, literature, medical books, et cetera, each on a separate page, which you can kind of see there in the image. Um, I also included a recommended topical database as well as web resources to encourage them to look at different types of sources to hone their information literacy skills. Each page was also an opportunity to highlight the subject librarian for that area if folks wanted to do in-depth research. I also included um, film, graphic novels, government information, journals, primary sources, and data sets in the same information literacy type setup, plus why you might want to use those formats in your research. For example, on the graphic novels and comics page, I mentioned that they can be used as a primary source material giving a snapshot of social issues of the time of publication. Additionally, academia, where peer-reviewed articles generally come from, is predominantly white, cisgender. Um, comics and graphic novels can be an avenue for publication for many historically marginalized groups that would otherwise have no voice in the publishing world. There are a few other aspects to the LibGuide, but I will cover them on the next slide, please. Um, we promoted the initiative in a few other ways. There were supposed to be two book displays, but COVID kind of forced us to reconsider how we handled that. We decided to turn them into topic blog posts that were cross-promoted to the LibGuides as well as social media. One was called Transgender Individuals in Public Policy uh, from Bathroom Bills to Employee Protection, which highlighted items in our digital library uh, government documents collection that went out November 2020 on the Transgender Day of Remembrance. The other one was a transgender authors and creative writing um, uh, 
virtual book display, which went out on the Transgender Day of Visibility, which we thought was a great way to celebrate some of the accomplishments of trans individuals, as well as raise awareness. We use social media to promote the guide in general, as well as specific parts of the guide. It was kind of interesting to see the spikes in the LibGuide usage when those postings went out. We also ordered service desk cards. There's an image of that on the left. They're business card size and went to the service desk in the library and to the offices of the Pride Alliance and the Women's and Gender Studies and LGBTQ Studies program for display there. Slide. We assessed our impact with multiple measures, including circulation statistics for our newly added items in the context of another collection assessment report, uh, hits on the guide, a survey widget asking was this guide helpful, likes or shares from social media, and anecdotal user feedback. We measured uh, LibGuide usage for a 10-month period. The guide had almost 1,400 total views. To put into context, um, 568 guides were published by our library during that time frame, and only 34 guides had more usage which is an excellent rate considering that the comparison includes topic guides with much broader appeal, such as the library's makerspace or the citations and style guide. The guide now has over 4,800 views since we launched it and is one of our most used topical guides. Based on guide usage, topics that were of most interest to users were graphic novels and comics by a wide margin film and subject pages, specifically medical, psychology, mental health. The assessment looked at circulation results from the period from September 2020 to August 2021. The assessment reported that 52% of the titles added had been used at least once. Two titles in, DD, in the DDA group, uh, Demand Driven Acquisition, had received sufficient usage to trigger their purchase for the ownership, and new additions were used significantly more than the legacy titles in the collection. Slide. While we did not request survey feedback from any users after the main objectives were complete, I did state on the guide that users were welcome to provide feedback directly to me via email. And I received a handful of messages, which considering most library users wouldn't usually write to a librarian about their perceptions of a guide or of library resources, I felt it indicated a strong resonance within the community. Two of the messages stated, in essence, that the readers were happy to see themselves in the books they found in the collection. Another message expressed gratitude for the work we were doing to raise awareness within the trans community. The last message is uh, the second quotation on the slide, and we felt gratified by this testimonial, and we're pleased that our efforts help persuade a potential student to select UNT for their graduate program. Slide. One part of our guide uh, for the trans students has a four librarian section. Beyond serving our immediate community, one of the aims of the initiative was to inspire other libraries to pursue similar efforts, and our hope is that we're doing that right now. The four librarians page uh, in the guide outlines the steps a library could take to create a similar initiative or modify it, and is basically the short version of this presentation um, and includes the best practices we recommend and our research resources. Some of our recommendations for best practices include conducting a needs assessment of the targeted user group. Understanding the community needs is a key element needed to ensure that the project meets its intended purpose. Developing relationships with members of the trans community and allies. These relationships can be crucial to the success of a project of this nature where the targeted user group is difficult to identify. Collaborators will be highly valuable in reaching the trans community. Communicating with the community to promote the initiative so they know that the purpose of the project is to bring about improvements in services and resources. 
following up with the community to demonstrate how the team used the community's input to select materials and develop or modify services, um, soliciting feedback and maintaining objectivity when the feedback indicates the library has not been meeting information needs of the targeted group, um, determining at the outset how you plan to assess the initiative's success. Um, if you don't have the administrative support that Kobe and I had, I think the most important thing is addressing the low-hanging fruit of getting your materials up to date, which can be done a little bit at a time, but you still need to signal to the community that you have new resources. Slide. Um, this slide documents the work cited in the presentation. Um, we apologize for the small font, but you can access the slide de deck and see the list after the uh, the session, or uh, or visit our online guide, and the link for that will be on the last page slide. So we have to give um, thanks. We extend our deepest gratitude to our strategic partners who helped us along the way. Kathleen Hobson is the director of the UNT Pride Alliance, who provided feedback and helped promote awareness of our work. Clark Pomerlow is a faculty member in history and an advocate for multiple LGBTQ plus causes who acted as a consultant and a co-investigator on our grant proposal. Karen Harker is the collection assessment librarian at UNT Libraries who provided her expert analysis on our trans collection. We got feedback from the subject librarians who were very supportive and provided some excellent suggestions. And of course, we are most grateful to the transgender students and faculty who helped spread the news about the initiative and who took the survey to help us make the best selections of the new content. Next slide, please. So that concludes our presentation. Uh, but we invite you to ask questions, make comments, or engage in a conversation with us about this project in the remaining time for today. Thank you for coming. Um, I can address your question, Donald. Um, so I was a government documents librarian for about a minute. Actually, Kobe was a government documents librarian also before he came to UNT. Um, and so I, I always like to include them in my LibGuides because I think students really overlook their value. Um, and that's why I decided to include it on this LibGuide. Um, I don't know if the materials receive significant usage. Um, I can say the... Um, the book display that I did um, for trans individuals in public policy uh, was very popular and had a lot of hits, um, which was all government documents. Um, but the government document page on the LibGuide does not get a whole lot of usage compared to the other pages. But I still hold out hope. Um, Kobe, do you know anything about, I don't know, I don't know if they, in collection assessment, if they look at government documents. Well, since we didn't ask, you know, since we didn't particularly point out that there might be uh, applicable content, they didn't assess it for us. But that's, that would be a next step, I guess, to try to figure out. Um, since there are many transgender issues in the court documents, as well as um, federal agencies trying to address things as varied as um, transgender people in the military or public accommodations for um, restroom facilities, that, that might be a next place to start looking at where can we enhance the guide and point people to transgender issues in the government documents collection. There's always more to do, right? Yes. Um, 
Emily, I hope I addressed your question in the chat. I don't know if Kobe wants to add anything to that, but Emily, no, not Emily, Erica. Erica asked, since UNT is a Hispanic serving institution, did you consider collecting any books on this topic in Spanish to address intersectionality? Um, oh, I know Kobe did mention that we uh, only included English language, um, but I suppose that is something we could look at um, going forward. So I guess there wasn't any Spanish language books in the survey for them to look at. Right, and you know, we, we have only recently be, been designated a Hispanic serving institution. So we are even now trying to figure out what does that mean for our collection development? Um, I know that um, the collection development department is looking at that particular issue. How do we support Spanish language materials as well as we have kind of a, for many years, our collection development policy has been to support purchase of languages that, that are taught in our world languages and literatures department. Um, but even so, um, we, we, we run into issues like, can anyone read Chinese or do we need to figure out how to catalog it uh, externally? And um, so Spanish language can be kind of, sadly, a similar thing. I speak some Spanish, um, but I don't think very many people in our collection development and cataloging department do. So um, we are looking at it, you know, we, we, we acknowledge, you know, we're, we're coming from our long legacy of white privilege, uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon based languages. And so we are looking at how can we rectify that and remediate it. Let's see, best starting point for someone in a Midwest public library. Well, um, I would say look around in your community and see if there's a, a resource center for, for people to kind of get an idea that of who might be interested in these materials. And then um, quietly one by one ordering some books about things like, I mean, the things that I thought was so interesting about some of our uh, respondents, just the whole, they don't care about memoirs. They don't apparently the the information need is met some other way but what they are interested are in th are things like how do i change the register of my voice how do i how do i raise the register of my voice if i'm transitioning from masculine to feminine or the vice versa um how do i negotiate the the medical and healthcare system you know where do i find a doctor that can help me with my transition. Um, so I would I would look closely at you know the kinds of materials that are available on those topics. Also, if you want to write to me, um, kobe.condry at unt.edu, I can send you the worksheet with the list of titles um, that we added. And I'm sure there will be new books that have been published since then, but that could be a nice way to get started. Um, I would also say try to mimic our approach of if you can offer it in an ebook format, you're going to be appealing to the audience of people that, I mean, maybe they're just thinking that they need to do some research on transitioning. Um, and it's kind of the people can be a afraid to even inquire about a topic that's controversial because they don't want to be branded in a certain way. Um, so making the ebook available really is a very um, sensitive way to make information available on a, on a topic that can be volatile. Um, Fred asked us, does your collection 
include anti-transgender materials such as legislation and anti-trans organizations. Sometimes it's good to know what the other side is doing. Um, oh yes, I request materials like that all the time. Um, I don't know that I have any of that highlighted in the LibGuide, but um, I like to uh, um, make sure that we have those uh, resources in there as well. Um, I see a question from Karen uh, asking about the tools we use for surveying and gathering feedback. Well, uh, we use an institutional tool called uh, Qualtrics. It's kind of clunky, but we actually now we have another tool that is offered by SpringShare. It's called LibWizard, and it it's actually pretty user friendly for creating simple surveys and gathering the data on them. Um, so that's that's basically what we we used Qualtrics to create these very, and I mean the they were very simple. It was like a list of ten books, and after each book title, the yes I'm interested, no I'm not, and then a little text box where they could they could add more information if they opted to do so. I think you could use um, SurveyMonkey as well if you aren't, um, if you're not at a place where uh, where they have access to something like that. Um, Amanda asked, "Do you all have plans for continuing to update the collection over time?" Um, since it's my subject area, I do continue to request. Um, uh, materials and uh, the uh, best practice is reassessing every three years. So uh, we'll ask for another collection assessment. Um, I don't know. Would that be next summer well, or the summer uh, after that? Yeah, I think it would be. Also, uh, just to give you some insight into how we do our collection development here at UNT, um, we basically let the subject librarians order what they like. Um, we used to have these little pots of money that was divvied up according to these subject areas, and that was just too unwieldy. So we went to a different system. It's based on a just-in-time model instead of a just-in-case model. We rely heavily. Uh, we make a big investment in our demand-driven acquisitions program. So a lot of stuff comes in um, to us automatically based on a profile um, through our our DDA program management vendor. And um, otherwise, uh, we allow the subject librarians to order what they like. So if if Julie becomes aware of a title that's going to be of, of interest or um, uh, especially valuable to this collection, she can just order it and, and, and we'll get it. So that, that's kind of how we handle our collection development for monographs anyway um, at this time. Um, oh, my, yes, yeah, go ahead, Julie. Michael asks, are you aware of any initiatives and or uh, did you at all look at how library spaces can be made more trans inclusive? Thanks. Um, some of the uh, the resources on our resources page address um, those issues, but um, some of the things um, off the top of my head um, would be, uh, of course, having, I shouldn't say of course, um, would be having the option for um oh spaces let's see uh 
gender neutral restrooms is one thing that you can make a space more trans inclusive. Um, we also have a um, a self checkout machine, which is nice for people if they don't want to go hand books out uh, or books to the person at the checkout desk. Um, you can have book displays that are, you know, signaling to the community that we're highlighting resources for you. Um, you can uh, you can put flags out and and such. You can train your staff to use um, uh, to not use gendered language when working with customers. Um, the the book that I mentioned by Steven Kruger um, about trans and inc uh, inclusive services for library patrons. I'm drawing a blank on the title. Um, he goes through um, every type of library function and addresses everything, you know, from collection development to access services to reference desk help. So um, I highly encourage everybody to um, pick up that book. Oh, nice, Emily. I like that uh, that funding opportunity you have there. Yeah, so if any attendees are in um, NNLM Region 5, we have an open grant opportunity um, that would allow you to copy this good work that Kobe and Julie are doing. Um, so it's a $1,500 award, and um, I put more information about it in the chat. And Kobe and Julie, I'm wondering if you noticed any trends in publishing as you were working on this project. Are there certain genres that you are seeing more books on transgender health uh, or other topics? Um, I guess I would say the trend I'm seeing is that there's acknowledgement in the publishing world that transgenderism is a separate topic from the lump LGBTQ plus. Um, they they are a very specific, they have very specific information needs. They 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 are not um, they are not homosexuals. They are not um, cisgendered. You know, I mean, there's just all sorts of issues unique to that group. And we are seeing more publishing to address their specific information needs instead of them kind of being hidden in the big alphabet soup where everyone kind of goes, oh, LGBTQ plus is a homogenous group of people. And it's it really is not. Toby and I even had some uh, raised eyebrows when we pitched this because Kobe just did a collection enhancement the year before for LGBTQ plus studies. And um, people were like, but we already did this. And it's like, okay, well, maybe, maybe there were three or four books in that collection enhancement um, uh, that were for trans folks. But, um, you know, most of the materials that were out there at the time were about cis gay men. Um, I can get on my feminist soapbox if anybody wants me to about that. Um, but yeah, uh, it uh, it was pretty frustrating to find that out when we were starting this. Um, project but um but yeah as kobe said it, it there seems to be an an improvement over the last couple of years 
Um, we have a question about, um, do we have recommendations for physicians, residents, nurses who want to know more? Well, I, of course, I'm a librarian, so I did a search of our catalog to see what we have, and there are some good titles. Um, unfortunately, the very first one that came up is rather old, but if you'll scroll down, here is a search in our library catalog. Um, uh, the second book is Adult Transgender Care and Interdisciplinary Approach for Training Mental Health Professionals. Um, the next one is Urological Care for the Transgender Patient, a Comprehensive Guide published in 2021. Um, another Comprehensive Care for the Transgender Patient uh, published in 2020. So um, those might be some, some good starting points for people who are in the medical profession. And Candace mentions they have a LibGuide specifically for healthcare practitioners. Thank you, Candace. That's a great, oh. that's a great resource. Yes, please do not invent the wheel. Someone else has already invented it. Oh, I, I, speaking of that, I will add as we're coming to a close here. Um, one of the things I did to make the LibGuide was I totally mined um, the LibGuides community and looked at every single LibGuide available that um, that had the word transgender in it somewhere. I mean, granted, there there was nothing like this, but usually there was a, a page or something like that um, in an LGBTQ LibGuide. Um, so definitely don't uh, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, the like, especially with the LibGuides community, those are guides out there that other people have said, yes, you can, you can use my ideas here. <laughs> Thanks, Fred. So we can keep taking questions, but I want to add one comment before we close out the session and take any last questions. I just dropped the link to the session evaluation, which includes the MLACE code. Um, so whether or not you want that MLACE code, please submit the evaluation. We love to get feedback on these sessions. It gives us great ideas for other sessions that we can offer for you all. Um, and I, there are a few more questions that have still come in, so I'm going to mute myself and Julie and Kobe, you can take the next question. Um, well, we were asked um, about, uh, about sharing it to the FDLP sharing hub. Um, I don't know anything about that, but I will ask. Um, uh, oh, okay. I can reach out to that person's email. I was going to say I'm going to ask our GovDocs librarian. Um, so let me copy that email address. And. Um, address that later. Thank you for suggesting that because, you know, we did say uh, beyond helping our students, the, the second priority was to um, get the word out there and inspire um, other libraries to do something similar. Um, and have, you know, people steal flash borrow our ideas, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see any questions. Yeah, it looks like missed. that's, we're wrapped up and we're at the top of the hour. Thank you so much. This was such a wonderful and informative session. And Marianne, thank you to you and the PNC diversity committee for for organizing this session it's wonderful thank you for having us didn't y'all have a couple slides after this 
uh, just the evaluation and then. Oh. All right, I'm going to stop the recording and close out the session.